Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 18 this morning. Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 18. We've been walking this slow and careful journey through the book of Acts, but we need to remember where we started in chapter 1, verse 8. The Lord Jesus Christ gave us the Great Commission. He told his disciples, his apostles, to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. And he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now as we've walked through the book of Acts, we have seen the church follow through with this great commission and take the gospel through all of these places. The Spirit came and empowered their witness in Jerusalem, and Peter proclaimed the gospel of God's grace uh, and the resurrected Christ, and thousands of people believed upon Christ and were born again in the city of Jerusalem. The church is scattered after the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 6. And then we see right after that, Stephen, I mean, uh, Philip goes and preaches the gospel in Samaria. The gospel continually is propelling outward from Jerusalem. And then when we get to chapter 10, we have this uh, enormous moment in redemptive history where Cornelius and his household believe upon the name of Christ and are saved. This is a, just a major movement in the story of Acts as the gospel goes outward in fulfillment of the Great Commission. However, Cornelius was primed and ready to receive the gospel. We are told even before his conversion that he was a devout man who feared God. We were told that he gave alms and he prayed continually to God. He was starting from a place of monotheism and an understanding of the God of the Bible. Um, so after hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ from Peter, he gladly believed upon the name of Jesus and was born again, received the Holy Spirit, and was baptized and added to the church. Now here in chapter 13, or in the previous chapter, we started to study Paul's first missionary journey. This was the first group of missionaries sent out from the local church to go into places where the gospel uh, had not been heard, or had been heard very little. So Paul and Barnabas are sent out from the church of Antioch in Syria to the Gentiles. And Paul followed this normal pattern, and he still follows that pattern throughout Acts, where he goes to the synagogue and to the city that he goes to, and he proclaims Jesus as the Messiah risen from the dead. But this trip that we're, look, we're looking at this morning to Lystra was different. We can assume that Lystra had no synagogue. Paul doesn't go to the synagogue. At least Luke doesn't mention a synagogue. Luke mentions a, a temple of Zeus there, but he doesn't mention a synagogue. So there must have been such a small amount of Jews in Lystra that there was no need for a synagogue. Now we do know that there were some Jews there, because later we learned that Timothy was from that area, and he was the son of a Jewish woman uh, who became a believer in Christ. But the impression that Luke gives us, at least in this story, as the gospel moves across the world, uh, the, the proclamation of good news that these missionaries are going to, 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 uh, to herald is going to face increasingly more pagan communities. It seems that the Gentiles that Paul and Barnabas are preaching the gospel to are even deeper in darkness the further they go. They're farther away from the truth than Cornelius because they don't even have a monotheistic view of God. They believe in many gods. So Paul and Barnabas are willing to risk their lives in the city of Lystra in order to preach the good news. And Paul urges them in our text this morning to turn from vain things, that's worthless things, to turn from that to the one true living God. So let's read, beginning in chapter 14, beginning in verse 8. Luke writes, Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, 
stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lycaonian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice to the crowd. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you that you are kind and generous. But we thank you that the gospel has come to us. Uh, we thank you that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. We thank you that he rose again on the third day. We thank you that there is forgiveness of sin in his name. And we thank you that you are a God who finishes what you started. So your word tells us that you will complete the work that you began in us. So we thank you so much for the grace that we receive just on a continual basis from you. Father, I pray that you'd be with us as we walk through this passage. Help us to see the truth that's in it and help us to learn what you'd have us to learn. Father, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So at the beginning of our text this morning, Luke relates to us another miracle story. Now we can immediately notice that this miracle story is very much like the miracle story that we read earlier in the book of Acts where Peter and John are walking up to the temple at the gate called Beautiful and they see this lame man there and you remember a uh, very similar situation and Peter says to him, silver and gold I do not have but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth rise up. Um, so perhaps the similarities in these miracles is, is purposeful. Maybe it's meant to show us that Paul's mission to the Gentiles is just as much a movement of the Holy Spirit as Peter's mission to the Jews, as the apostle to the Jews and Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. God was clearly working through both of these apostles as he authenticated their efforts with these miracles. God is at work in the world. Now in Lystra, this lame man was listening to Paul speaking. We're told in verse 7 in our text from last week that uh, Paul and Barnabas continued preaching the gospel. So Paul was preaching the good news of the gospel. He was preaching about the risen Christ who died in the place of sinners and rose again on the third day in whose name and in whose only name there is the forgiveness of sin. Now Luke tells us a few things about this lame man. First, he was sitting, sitting on the ground. He could not walk. He could not use his feet, he says. And he was crippled from birth, and he had never walked. So let's just take a moment and imagine this man's situation. There had not been one single day of his entire life where he took even one step. He could not use his feet. He had never even stood up. He had never even been able to stand. Um, he almost certainly, like the lame man of Acts chapter 3, who sat at the temple gate begging alms, he almost certainly had to do the same. He would have to beg for support, for food, for the things that he needed to live, uh, to, uh, you know, money and all those sorts of things. And I certainly doubt that they had any sort of wheelchair in those days. He was probably carried on a stretcher everywhere that he went. He was dependent upon 
other people every moment of every day of his life. Who knows the difficulty and internal struggle that this man faced all throughout his life. But the Lord, in his great kindness, allowed this man to hear some incredible news on this particular day at this particular moment in history. So this man sat there listening to Paul, and Paul looked intently at him. Whatever it was, somehow he drew Paul's gaze as Paul was preaching. And Luke says in verse 9 that Paul saw that he had faith to be made well. Now that does not mean that anyone who has faith to be made well will be healed from whatever sickness that they have or disease that they have, as if the power is in the faith. The power is not in the faith. The power is in the object that you place your faith in, okay? And God works according to his own will. Will So God decides to heal based purely um, according to his will and not necessarily the measure of your faith. You can have all the faith in the world, but if it's not God's will, it's not going to happen. So this text does not mean that anyone who has a certain measure of faith can be well, nor does it mean that the reason you are not made well and whatever you're dealing with right now is because you have a lack of faith. That's what the false teachers say when their healings don't work. They just blame it on you. Well, you don't have enough faith. Maybe God is not giving you immediate healing right now because he's doing so many things through your suffering that you cannot even comprehend. Maybe he's doing a hundred different things or maybe a thousand different things in your life for your sanctification and for your better understanding of who he is. And maybe, just maybe, you're going through that and the rest of us are watching and God is doing a hundred different things in our lives as we watch you suffer well for the glory of God. So don't just yearn for healing. Yearn for the healer. Furthermore, the word translated to be made well is the exact same word in the Greek to be saved. Sozo is the word. You can write that down in your devotional journal there, but um, Luke may be using this way, this word in this way purposefully to communicate that it's not just one or the other. It's not just that he's getting physically, physically healed, and it's not just that he's getting spiritually healed. God is doing both of these things. As this man sat and listened to the proclamation of the gospel, he had heard about the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ that gives eternal life to everyone who believes upon his name. So maybe the faith that Paul saw in him was the faith that the Lord had the power to heal him and the Lord has the power to save him from his sin. And I tell you what, the latter is more important than the former. Um, Paul looked at him and saw that he had this faith. And he said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And this man sprang up and began Walking, He literally leaped up and started doing what he had never done, not a single day in his entire life. Now, we don't get the impression from here or in uh, the earlier chapters of Acts that this was a slow process where he needed to you know, shake the dust off his feet, feet or, or, or stretch out his, his ligaments. And I don't know, the older I get, when I just stand up from a chair, it, it takes me a minute. You know, it wasn't like that. He didn't need physical therapy. He didn't need a cane. He didn't have to learn how to walk. He leaped up. He jumped up and started walking. This is the power of God at work in this man's life. He was immediately healed, not by Zeus, Hermes, but by the living God, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that word for spring up, maybe your translation says leap. That's how it's translated earlier in Acts. Um, it's, it's, it's translated that way in Acts chapter 3. It's also translated that way in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 in verses 5 and 6, Isaiah is prophesying about the Messianic age, and he says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. 
Listen, the healing in the book of Acts are not promises for every single person uh, to be healed in this life. Okay, that's just evidently not true, right? Because we all deal with things. Um, but they are a glimpse of the fullness of the future kingdom. One day, a day described in the Bible as a day coming soon, every person who has believed upon his name will be completely healed of every ailment. Some of you deal with constant pain or sickness or whatever it is that you're going through some sort of physical suffering. And no matter how hard you try to explain that to other people, nobody really knows what you face but you and God. Um, but if your faith is in Christ alone, then you have to remember, you have to train your mind to understand and remember and believe that suffering is temporary. The sovereign God who has absolute knowledge of your suffering. He, he knows it better than you do. And he knows when it will end and all of those things. The one who has sovereign knowledge of your suffering wrote in his word that it is a light and momentary affliction that is preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all compare. You know, the older I get, the more I hate traveling. Now, I don't like going, being in different places. I like being at destination B. I just don't like traveling from A to B. I just want to be there. If they ever invent the beam me up, Scotty thing, I'm going to be happy about that because I hate the traveling part. More and more as I get older, it doesn't matter if it's, Driving or flying or taking a train, I just don't like it. It's uncomfortable. My body gets stiff. I get bored. I want to move up, I, uh, move around and stand up and, and stretch out and all of those kinds of things. And you can't do it. And, it, and it's just terrible being stuck in a plane or in a car uh, along the way. But I have learned a trick. I, I think I've told you this before, but I have learned a trick that I I have to focus on the destination and not my discomfort in the travel. When I focus on how uncomfortable I am in the traveling, it's much worse. If I focus on how hot it is on the plane or how that little stupid little vent is not nearly enough, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, that's a joke. Why do you even do that? You know, give me something more than that. Or if the person is next to me is rolling over into my area, or here's the worst, if they want to talk to me. Uh, you know, there's a trick to that. You put in your earbuds. Now, I know a lot of people witness on planes and all of that. My problem is I can't hear what they're saying because of all the noise and everything. So I'm like, I'm trying to avoid eye contact and those kinds of things. It's uncomfortable. I don't enjoy it. I don't like it. If I focus my thoughts on all the things I don't like about it, then I'm just, it's just misery compiled. So what I do is I try to focus my thoughts on my final destination. I remind myself that in a few hours, I'm going to be wherever it is that I'm going. So if I'm traveling to uh, my parents' house, then I'm thinking about pulling up in the driveway and then coming out of the garage and them embracing me for a hug and seeing my sister and her children. And I think about all those. I think about eating my mom's food. It really helps a lot. If I'm going to a pastor's conference, then I'm thinking about seeing my friends. I'm thinking about being rejuvenated as I hear faithful men preach the word or those kinds of things. If I'm coming home from a trip, then I'm thinking about seeing my wife and kids and thinking about sleeping in my own bed, and all of those things that you enjoy coming back from a trip. Now, I don't think it's all that different for us as Christians. We have to continually remind ourselves of the final destination. We are journeying through this life. We are not meant to be miserable here every step of the day. We are 
We are meant to have joy here in the midst of a fallen and crooked, perverse generation that we live in. We are meant to glorify God in the midst of all of that, but we've got to focus our thoughts on where we are going and what the final destination will be. And if you're suffering, then you've got to focus on that. But this is temporary. You've got to train your mind to understand that your difficulty, your pain, and your suffering is a temporary thing because that's what God's Word says. Now, <laughs> sounds easy to say that, doesn't it? I don't think it's easy, but I do think it's necessary. So I want to encourage you this morning to do this now. Now, the crowds in Lystra see this amazing miracle, this man that they've known, they've watched sit there and probably beg and have to have people help him up onto his cot or a cart or whatever it is he uses to travel about. They know who he is. They see him be miraculously healed at the power of the name of Jesus, and he jumps up and he's walking around. And how do they explain this? They're, they're filled with excitement. However, they misunderstand the whole situation, don't they? They lift up their voices. Luke tells us the crowd lift up their voices, and they're speaking the local language, Lycaonian. I don't know if anybody speaks that anymore. Obviously, Paul and Barnabas did not speak this language. They did not know what was happening at first. They had no idea what was going on. And they said in their own language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Zeus. Zeus was the chief god of the pantheon of gods. Paul was called Hermes, uh, who was the... Uh, Paul was the chief speaker there. He was the one preaching, evidently. And Hermes was the Greek god of language or communication. He was the messenger of the god. Now, what happened next was the priest of Zeus comes from the temple of Zeus and wants to offer sacrifices with the crowd to Paul and Barnabas, thinking that they were these Greek gods. So this priest was planning a worship service with Paul and Barnabas as the object of worship. Now, in verse 14, they finally realize what's happening, and they're just devastated. Luke tells them they tear their clothes, and they rush out into the uh, crowd to try to stop this false worship service. Now, just a side note that we need to talk about here. In verse 14, uh, Luke calls Barnabas and Paul apostles. Okay. Now, the term apostle is used in different ways in the New Testament, a couple of different ways in the New Testament. Most of the time, the kind of technical use of the term is when it's referring to the 12 apostles plus Paul, okay? Um, these were the men who were given special authority at the foundational stage of the church, okay? Um, the New Test. this is very important because the New Testament, is, is, is it needs to be linked to an apostle. Um, so what we have today, we are, we are proclaiming what the apostles proclaimed, uh, and they proclaimed what they heard from Christ. So it's very important that we have an understanding of what an apostle is. But there are a few others outside of the twelve and Paul who are also called apostles. The word apostle just means sent one. Uh, these uh, few are called apostles, but they are not apostles in the strict sense that the twelve were. They are sent, they are on the mission, they are proclaiming the gospel, but they weren't necessarily those who were walking with Jesus and were taught by Jesus and sent out directly by Jesus. They weren't necessarily those men who had witnessed the resurrection with their own eyes. Earlier in the book of Acts, Luke records to us um, uh, the apostles choosing a replacement for Judas. So in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, Luke says, so one of the men, they, this, is how they, this is the qualification for how they find a, a replacement. One of the men who has accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went out, went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness of his resurrection. So Barnabas uh, was not an apostle in the same exact sense that Paul was or the twelve were. Uh, now, also, there's another use of the word uh, apostle that just means messenger. We see this in the book of Philippians. Epaphroditus was this messenger between Paul and the, and the church of Philippi. He was called an apostle, and it just means that he was sent as a messenger. 
Uh, nonetheless, Paul and Barnabas are full of grief and dismay because these men, these uh, crowds, were wanting to uh, worship them. So they rend their garments, they, they rip their clothes to demonstrate their displeasure with the whole situation. This is a common Jewish practice in light of uh, heinous evil or blasphemy or terrible situations. Uh, horrible uh, situation that produced grief. They would rend their garments, and then they rush out into the crowd to try to stop this idolatrous worship. Now, do you remember in chapter 12, we read about a Herod, Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, in chapter 12, uh, speaks to a crowd, and they venerate him uh, as a god. They say the voice of a god and not a man. And do you remember what Herod did? Basically, Herod did this right here. If there were pictures in the Bible, if there were videos, he, he, he did this right here. Come on. Give it to me. He didn't reject the worship. He didn't say, no, 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 no. That's reserved for the one true and living God. He didn't do that. He said, come on. Give it to me. Because Herod's primary object of worship was also himself. So when other people wanted to worship him, he gladly received it. And you remember what happened to him? The, the text says that an angel struck him down immediately and he was eaten by worms and died. Paul and Barnabas knew that story. <laughs> Don't you think? Uh, they didn't want that to happen. So they, they rent their garments. They were like, no, we got to stop this. They rush out into the crowd and they say, men, we cannot do this. Please do not do this. Why are you doing this? We are men just like you. Paul said, we are here to bring you good news. We are here to preach the gospel to you. Listen, Paul and Barnabas are not the ones who grant salvation. They are not the ones who give grace. Neither are they the ones who heal by their own power. They're simply conduits of the power of God. And as part of this gospel message that they proclaim, they must proclaim repentance. So Paul says, listen, turn from false worship to true worship. He says, turn from Vain things. The ESV translates vain things to the living God. Your translation may say worthless things. What are these vain and worthless things? Well, they are things that are futile, useless, and empty. They have no power in themselves, no content in themselves. They are nothing. The worthless, vain things that the people of Lystra needed to turn away from was their false understanding of a plurality of God. It was this false view of a pantheon of God. That's a worthless, empty thing. These gods are not gods at all. They are nothing. They do not exist. They are powerless and empty. This lame man that was healed was healed by the power of the one true God and not by the power of false gods or those idols made of wood and stone and those kinds of things. None of those false gods could ever do this work. This is the work of the creator God of the universe. The only God who rules and reigns. The only God who can bring salvation to the sinful people of this world. The only God who has power over his creation. The only God who can create something from nothing. The triune God who holds history in his hand. And he has set the day when he will bring the end of all things. He is the one and only judge of all humanity. Paul, in his preaching, at this point, had to try to clarify some of these things to get them on the same page with monotheism. That there is one true God, and these other gods are false gods, and we need to turn away from them. You cannot add Christ to the pantheon of God and call yourself a Christian. That's not how Christianity works. To believe in Christ is to forsake all others. So to help them see the error of their ways, Paul gives them a little bit of information about the living God. First he says he is a living God. He is not an object made of wood or stone. He is not a mute object. He is the living God. Second, he is the creator of everything. Paul says he made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. The one true God created everything that exists with the word of his mouth. There was nothing. He spoke, and then everything burst into existence. 
there is none like him. His power and his might are far beyond what we can possibly comprehend. And because of the greatness of his glory and his holiness, it is high treason to worship anything other than him. We were created to worship him. We worship anything, ourselves like Herod or false gods or anything. It is high treason. That's why sin is so sinful and sin is so terrible. Because we are meant to worship him and adore him because he is the greatest, most glorious object of worship in the universe. Because he is the creator who stands above it all. Next, Paul says that in past generations, he let the nations walk in their own ways. Now, that does not mean that God swept sin under the rug or that he didn't hold them accountable. In past generations, God worked with the nation of Israel and, and, and he let the nations go. Um, Paul is highlighting here his mercy and his forbearance. He, he was merciful in that he did not immediately pour out his wrath upon them. He let them go, but he did not let his own people go. He did not let Israel go in their own ways. He worked in their lives. But now things are different. Now the gospel is going forth. He is calling all people everywhere to repent and believe and to turn from their false worship to the worship of the one true and living God. Now, Paul preaches a similar sermon uh, with more content in Acts chapter 17. And he says in verses 29 through 31 this, he says, being then God's offspring. So he had already established in Acts chapter 17 that God is the creator of mankind. So he's being God's offspring. We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. There is only one God and there is only one way of salvation for all people on this planet and it is through Christ alone. And now, even now, is the time for everyone to repent and believe this gospel. Paul says he did not leave himself without witness. Uh, even in past generations, he revealed himself in the governance of his creation. He sent rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, and satisfied their hearts with food and gladness. This is not the work of false gods or mute gods or idols made of wood and stone. There is only one true and living God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. So no one is going to stand before God on Judgment Day and be able to plead ignorance. Pastor Mark read Romans chapter 1 uh, earlier. And I don't know about you, but I could, I could feel the weight of the Word of God. Um, and I hope that while we read Romans 1 like we did today, we, especially in the month of, of June, and we see like this is, this is our culture. I don't want to have the attitude of like let's stick it to our enemies. When he read that, it broke my heart because like we are seeing this right now in our world. And what it should do to us, it should, it should, it should wound our heart. Because I think that's what it does to God. It breaks his heart. But also, it needs to be motivation for us to do what God has called us to do. Everything that we do as the church is so important. Because what we want from the world, this pagan world that we live in, increasingly more dark in our country, what we want is for them to Turn from worthless things to the living God. And to do that, every effort that you make at your own personal holiness, it matters to them. Every effort you make at loving one another and fulfilling the one another's of the New Testament, it matters to this mission. Every time you strive towards the discipline and instruction of your children, it matters. 
even when you give, it matters. When you strive to, to maintain the unity in the church, it matters. And when you open your mouth to declare the mysteries of Christ to people who are filled with all sorts of false religion, it matters. This is what we want. This is why we do what we do. We got a lot of work to do. We got to be faithful. Now, Luke reports even with Paul's admonition to the crowds, they barely prevented the people from worshiping. He barely stopped the false worship service from happening. And as we move on into the text that we'll be looking at next week, we see that Paul's sermon was cut short. Unbelieving Jews from Antioch and Iconium, previous cities that Paul preached at, came, they followed Paul, found out where he was, and they stirred up the crowds against Paul, and the people stoned Paul. He dragged him out of the city, leaving him for dead. Luke tells us that Disciples, his disciples gathered around him, and Paul got back up and went right back into Paul. Paul was a relentless missionary, wasn't he? I think the Lord has has blessed me with a little bit of like stick to itness, but if y'all take me out and stone me, I'm probably gonna quit. So if you don't like me, then that's probably what you gotta do. Um, man, what a relentless missionary. What was it that did this to this man? Listen, it wasn't winning an argument. I don't think it was, you know, I don't think, in, in later travels, they go back to Lystra. Not just in this initial moment. They go back to Lystra. They go back to Iconium. They go back to Antioch. What was it in Paul that made him do this? It wasn't just like, hey, I'm going to win this argument. I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to stick it to the to the enemy. It wasn't that. It wasn't some sort of crazy desire to be punished or to live on the edge and do something risky. Or certainly wasn't for him to boast in himself and look what I can do with these dangerous things. Paul. Paul was overwhelmed by the grace that he received. And it wasn't even just that. It was that he was overwhelmed with the greatness of knowing the one who gives grace to sinners. Paul knew him. Listen, do you, do you know him? I mean, do you know him? I, I'm not just saying, listen to me, children and youth. Listen to me. I'm not just saying, do you know some things about him? Some of you may be able to give some good theological arguments for the gospel. I'm not saying that. That's important. Don't get me wrong. But do you know him? Can you describe to me him? He, he, is, he is incredible. Uh, this God who gives grace sinners like us. This God who chooses to use people like us to be the ones that take the greatest message in human history to the lost and dying world. The God who has made a place for us, is making a place for us in heaven where there will be no more crying, there will be no more pain, there will be no more sickness, there will be no more death, or we will dwell in a place without sin and we will worship Him without sin. We will dwell in unity with each other without getting aggravated with each other. Not that that ever happened. If you're a believer in Christ, you have a glorious future. But the greatness of our future is not going to be just what we get. Because if God's not there, I don't want to go. The greatness of the final destination is that He is there and we will see Him in His glory. And billions and billions of years from now, we will not be bored 
with our daily worship of the one true and living God. Listen, if you've not believed upon his name, I want to I want to urge you with every fiber of my being repent and believe the gospel right now. Turn from whatever worthless things prevent you from believing in him and place your faith in Christ alone, the only one who has salvation. And he will save you and he will make you new and he will give you eternal life and forgiveness of sin. And the greatness of knowing him far exceeds anything else in this world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the greatness of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the people in this room. I pray your richest blessing on each and every person. Father, I pray for those who've been walking with you for many, many years, that you would remind them of the greatness of knowing you. Father, I pray for those who have studied theology and have um, a, a really good grasp on the Word of God. Father, I pray that you would remind them of how great you are, that their theology would not end with simply knowing things about you, but knowing you. Father, I pray for those who are very young in their faith, Lord, that they would they would grow. They would grow in their knowledge of you, not just intellectually, but also personally. And Father, I pray for those who are unbelievers in this room, that you would show them that they're unbelievers that you would grip their hearts and that you would save them from their sins. Father, I pray that they would turn and believe and that you would save them and we would be able to help them grow like life. Father, we love you. We trust you. In your name we pray. Amen.